Uh, I think uh, we actually should give now this little extra time that we have to Alexander Shevchenko, who has a very interesting speech uh, directly from the, the ground in Ukraine. Please, uh, Alexander, you have initiated a, uh, a network which you call Restart Ukraine, and that happened when you had to flee from Melitopol in uh, the Cherson region when the Russians arrived, as I understood it. And we met in, in Katowice in, in Poland in the World Urban Forum in the end of June. That was There was a so-called Ukraine track uh, where I got my first lesson in those very complicated strategies. So please. Thank uh, you, Per Michael. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alexander, Ukrainian urbanist. I'll try, as, I, as I'm talking the first one today from Ukraine, I'll try to give you a bit more of the context. So uh, I used to work in the field before the war as well, and there was a number of projects running, which Per Mikhail mentioned. But uh, since the war has started, we re reorganized ourselves as professionals to help them uh, on the long-term basis look for more sustainable and greener future. And there were already some challenges on ground, of course. But since the war has started, uh, from one hand, it really made things really worse and bad, for, but from the other side, it accelerated certain discussions which need very exact and precise solutions. So this slide represents, on my presentation, please, yeah. This slide represents that shift we tried to think about uh, going from this sectorial silos based uh, uh, oriented planning where you have economy, ecology, mobility, environment, uh, to uh, thematic uh, clusters, which we believe right now for Ukraine is really something needed because you cannot plan the post-war recovery with the uh, with the previous tools, with the old-fashioned tools. So we just suggested a certain number of steps you should go through, which is uh, data-based decision-making, which is like observe and Ukraine and data really is an issue to find the reliable and up-to-date data to make some steps. Then the, one, the other one is the one we talk today most of all is reclaim. How do we bring people back and what is the general principle for that? And I will showcase it on example of one of the cities later on. Uh, the third one is we call it clean, which is about debris management. More and more we see that uh, there is so many uh, damage and destruction and we can, cannot simply ignore that and we cannot bring it to the dumb side at all. The other one is that we believe it's not really only a post-war recovery, it's like future-oriented recovery and we have very precise challenges upcoming ne next years and if we miss them in our approach uh, we will be very soon outdated with our planning. Then uh, remember as a part of uh, as a part of bringing the the, the personality of people, the personality of what has happened to the to the built environment. And then we go to the classic steps of planning, financing, participating in building. So just like very brief, uh, yeah, very brief uh, description of what we think should be important. But before we have started to uh, suggest any actions, because like it's really an area of unknown for all of us in Ukraine. So it was learning by doing, most of all. We tried to look on different, uh, if you could just bring this screen back in, in front of me, that would be useful. Um, we looked at different practices of post-war recoveries all, of, all over the world. And one of uh, which we, which strived us was the case of Balkans and recovery of Sarajevo. And we discovered that the resources were there in terms of recovery. However, there was no really plan for the recovery and the case of uh, Sarajevo showed us how uh, this balance between environmental and, and economical and demographical components brings that the city which is in the valley was uh, constructed mainly in the center and uh, caused pollution and congestions and the idea of recovery was really lost. So this is something as a lessons learned and definitely that's something we would like to avoid. Because from one side, you really need houses for, for people to come back before the winter. But from the other side, you cannot do it randomly because otherwise you will lose this 
flow from short term recovery to the long term planning. So uh, just to give you a bit of the context, Ukraine is really huge and it's, it's really big in terms of land and area. And uh, this is one of the uh, researched by the World Bank. It is an urbanization report which, which was done in 2014 when the war has actually started and uh, it gives an understanding what was going on with the cities and municipalities in Ukraine, which has a direct link and direct connection to the housing right now. So you see that um, aging and, de and decreasing of population was there in general, everywhere. However, it was not really equal. So in the east it was more dynamic, in the west it was more moderate. Um, we were starting to move from this mono-industrial economy to the service-based economy. So the east and the south are mainly characterized by these big factories and metallurgy and mining, and uh, but also agriculture. So that gives us an, a hint, like if a person comes back, what he does if the main factory is destroyed. And the other one is that agglomerations start to grow in the west much more in than in the east, which creates a certain conditions and environment for Ukraine. Okay, so uh, we still have, like, okay, the number of, of cities and municipalities occupied is really thousands. So it's not like few dozens, it's really a lot. And all of them uh, will definitely need a certain recovery because we see the occupied areas. Um, so occupied area can be more or less okay, but when it's de occupied, it's really destroyed. Um, and the area is really big, so it's like few European Union countries together. So just a very brief and basic context. So Ukraine has 25 regions, and for the moment it's like almost half of them affected directly, but it doesn't mean the other ones are not. So the Daesh area is the one where Russian troops are or were, but the other ones are also hit by uh, shelling and missiles attacks. And they are uh, also a place of the increased um, effect by the IDPs. Uh, there is also a number of areas which should be checked in terms of mining, which in terms of agriculture in Ukraine gives a certain pressure to the, to the land. So, yeah, and th there you see the most um, effect uh, by the uh, battles uh, in this blue and red. <coughs> so for us, the recovery plan is basically combining two things, uh, local context and global trends, which I said before, and dealing, let's say, with housing. We need to carry in mind some number of other aspects. And I will just give an another example. If you, uh, if you wish for a city to develop further when it has lost the major of the medium and large enterprises, you cannot put the temporary housing everywhere. You need to carefully plan where, where do you place it. So you have some vacant slots of land where you can establish points of growth later on. And it's very dynamic in time. So yeah, this was mentioned by many stakeholders from Ukraine that there are certain phases in time which uh, we believe might be working, but they should be somehow organized in a certain similar logic. So emergency response should not be like principally and conceptually different from then adaptation and sustainable development in the future. In very simple words, we call it uh, first response and then back to normal and then points of growth, which means that we create conditions where people can live and overcome the winter, then we can create conditions where the people can re really come back and uh, bring, people, uh, bring children to school, go to work, uh, practice their no normal, ordinary life after the war. And then we sit down and think, how do we develop the country in the future? So housing is one of the aspects we definitely need to look upon, but not the only. And uh, I will try to give you just a very quick overview of Ukraine, which I believe my colleagues will be also talking today later on, from three perspectives, which is economic, environmental, and uh, demographical. Because of, we have, uh, because of the fact we have such a long border with Belarus and Russia, 
landwards and seawards, and also with Transnistria, which is also a problem. We have like a few thousands of kilometers of potential problem. So um, here you see in most violet uh, color, the most uh, export productive regions, which you see are actually also the epicenters of the war right now. You see so, uh, so many transit corridors, which right now are blocked, and I think they will be blocked for, for a longer time. Right now, yesterday, the president said that we should stop all the export to Russia, no matter what goods is that. So those uh, lines are now useless. And it, it means something for those uh, municipalities and cities on the routes, because so many of them were actually based on this logistics and uh, transit-oriented um, growth. And then, of course, the damage patterns. So uh, just an example of Azov Steel, you all know. Um, that and other factor in Mariupol were given like 3% of GDP, direct and indirect. It was uh, like 40,000 of people employed directly. Then you add families, then you add support in small and medium enterprises. And you get a really big number of people which depend on the certain economic unit. And uh, talking about Mariupol, okay, we recover the housing, but yeah, there is another question to ask, like where do these people uh, get uh, the money to live from? So this is a very uh, complex question for the further city planning, especially in the east where we have so many mono-industrial cities. Uh, environment. Uh, I just focus on a few points here, which are the nature-protected areas, which were really impacted right now, which is the climate change, which is an uh, issue, because before the war there were already some signs, early signs of lack of fresh water, and especially if you read the news for the southern cities, uh, you might discover some challenges with the fresh water. Um, and then, of course, the impact of the fires and bombing. And there was also in different colored dots, you see the main pollutants all across the country. So, of course, this goes a bit beyond the focus right now. But if we address it holistically, we need to think like, OK, um, if we recover the city, if we recover the housing, what else should we look on? Because there will be no other time where we do this revision. The demography, uh, comparing to 2014, when it was around one to two million of people being displaced from the east, right now it's like it was every third or fourth person in Ukraine being displaced either internally or externally. At the moment, I believe there is around 4 million of people being replaced from Ukraine to countries as Poland, Germany, Sweden, and so on and so forth. And it's a matter, how do you bring them back? Because uh, it is a very, um, it's, not, it's not rational, it's uh, irrational, it's a psych a human psychology. And uh, uh, recent surveys show that it's the sense and the uh, feeling of safety and security. And how do you create that? Is it uh, the anti-missile systems or it's something else? Is it another way of designing and developing the houses? Is it developing the public spaces? What are the key um, triggers for people to come back? Because without that will, the housing issue, of course, is important, but we need all the people in order to recover the country. So I give you one example. And uh, I believe we have a panel discussion today, later on, and workshop tomorrow, so I won't go too much in the details, I'm trying to track the time. Chernihiv is a city in the north, so it's, I don't know, I don't know, have a, a laser here, but it's somewhere like over there in the top. A city which was tightly connected to Russia in terms of the environment and uh, surrounding, so it was too, 182,000 inhabitants, which decreased almost three times to the march. And here in the red squares, uh, you see the areas of destructions. In green dots, you see the points of the shelters where people can hide from the missiles. So it's a very disbalanced system. And that's what I was saying. There were problems even before the war. So, But many people um, 
uh, will return, but how to motivate those who don't think to return yet. So we tried to categorize a bit more the cities um, in kind of zones. Red is the direct contact with uh, the Russian troops. The yellow is kind of the buffer and the green is the safe zone. And this, uh, this di divide them also in three sizes, which is like village, town and city, to put it simple. And we look at this bigger city called Chnihiv, close to the red zone, to the direct contact with Russia. And we need to consider different scales here. In state, uh, in context of the state, <coughs> it is the less uh, dense uh, area, so really a low density of population there, uh, which didn't really help to create very diverse and vibrant economic conditions in terms of urban life, rural, li rural life. Uh, it is a strategic buffer between Kyiv and Russia. Um, it is uh, basically transit to Russia, which is the only way to, to for the logistics. So right now, when the border, border is closed, there is no reason to go to Chnihiv, otherwise you want to go as a tourist. And, and then um, the outflow of population, you see the density. And then we look at the regional context, saying that Chernihiv is a regional center which uh, has some very important role for the surrounding places in terms of logistics, in terms of uh, social services and infrastructure. And right now, the key key numbers here is that a lot of mined areas, which will take like years to, to recover, a lot of housing destroyed and damaged, and how do we prioritize our uh, uh, we, we how do we prioritize our actions here? At the same time, it's one of the older cities. It was built along the right bank of the river, and it has some certain natural limitation to grow. So the land use was dominated by the residential areas, but there were some also barriers caused by the railway. So I'm saying all of that to give you understanding that of course, like in, in Swedish cities, there are some natural um, limitations to to recovery. So it's conceptually, like when we started to think it's easy to, okay, we, we define the areas when we build temporarily housing there and that's it. No, unfortunately not, because then we face many different um, uh, limitations such as uh, private property rights, legal framework and existing barriers. and. Uh, here are just some few of them. Um, so the most of the effect was uh, damage was uh, affected by uh, on the residential areas um, and uh, also the social infrastructure. Um, due to the decreased number of social infrastructure, people were forced to travel longer distances, and due to the um, to the collapse of the public transportation system, uh, especially the trolley buses, then we have to look on the cycling infrastructure. It is a really blue-green city in terms of the natural environment, but at some point this river became a barrier to evacuate. So all the bridges were blown down, the railway br uh, bridge and the car bridge, and then the city was in a state of collapse to evacuate. Sometimes they were evacuating just by boats. So here you see how it works in terms of the logistics. All three roads to the north lead to Russian, Belarus and are potential threats, so we cannot evacuate over there. So there's only one bottleneck through which you can go out from the city. So yes, uh, back to housing, uh, which links very much to what was said before. Uh, considering those three phases of the response, we see different uh, options which were used by Ukraine. So first, it was a very good organized response on this public infrastructure which was reorganized. However, then we, we met some slightly difficulties. When we go to the temporary housing, from one hand there is a big discussion that there is nothing more permanent than temporary structure. So cities are afraid of doing something temporarily and there is a lack of uh, variety and imagination to stay for their entire country so the key 
and main solution was these containers you see on the screen placed sometimes in the parks. So this idea of light prefab houses uh, out of timber or prefabricated constructions is yet to be developed. And uh, the other point is the spatial distribution within the city. And then the other, the other thing is how do we go mid-term and long-term? And it's a matter of big discussion because there is a lot of square meters being uh, developed and built yet already. How do we enable the system to redistribute those square meters for those who really need that? So this is another aspect of this uh, policy making which goes on right now in the parliament. So one of those midterm solutions is using this uh, social infrastructure which starts to develop all around uh, Ukraine, mainly in the West. And uh, surprisingly, it is an NGO connected to the international funds which enable such um, projects. So it's not like scaled up and uh, massively replicated. So there is a definitely uh, a place to think about that. But yeah, then back to our idea, can we actually select and see the areas where we can place this temporarily housing? So we tried to figure out what could be the parameters uh, that that sh should be some areas which were damaged, of course, uh, the, the areas with the lowest building coverage ratio and closer to the city center. So the idea of creating a certain settlement um, adjacent to the main city is being really criticized right now because otherwise you disintegrate people from the real life. So uh, here we selected some few areas where you can place new types of units and people will be integrated. It's not the same as create a district like over here and it would be a kind of gated community to the entire city. So uh, yeah, and then um, even doing that, we still have uh, some uh, shorter, medium term, long term solutions to suggest. And housing, of course, is amongst them. And uh, I would just uh, like to end up with these critical uncertainties, which directly affect how we do address the idea of the housing in Ukraine which I just allow you to read and to reflect. And I think there will be much space for the discussion later on today and tomorrow. And uh, if you would like to follow what we do, there are also some social media pages. You can find them by Restart Ukraine in Facebook and Instagram. And I believe the translation works right now quite good. So you can stay tuned with that. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your time.